in. Welcome. I am Tammy Grimes. Chess playing isn't regarded as a dangerous pastime. And rightfully so. Of course, there are stories, perhaps apocryphal, about the game being played in ancient times with real people instead of pieces. And then indeed, it can become deadly. Even today, however, we read about the use of mind-controlling devices and other mystic aids in world championship matches. But chess, among those who play it for fun, is just harmless relaxation. Or is it? I'm not interested in playing any more chess with the old man. I'm telling you, here and now, I'm finished. No more chess. You're not thinking, Charlie. You're letting yourself be driven by silly superstitions. If you refuse to play this game, it could be dangerous for you. Deadly dangerous, remember that. And the next move is yours. <laughs> mystery drama, The Chess Master, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Paul Hecht and Fred Gwynn. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Most Americans lead lives that are fairly routine. Some might even describe their lives as humdrum. But there are a few fortunate enough to be working in jobs they like. Others find life tolerable, if not dramatically exciting, with a series of highs and lows. However, when a real crisis arises, some people go right off the rails. And others, in trying to cope, find themselves faced, at the very least, with a sweeping change in their lifestyles. I was fired today. It was my first time. I started to walk, just walk, aimlessly around New York. My compulsive walking took me to the lobby of one of the city's newest glass towers. It has a beautiful two-story lobby that runs an entire block and was used as a walkway between the streets. As I walked through, admiring the ficus trees and the artificial waterfall, my eye was caught by a chessboard completely set up for a game. Seated behind the board was a portly, white-haired gentleman who smiled up at me as I halted. Good afternoon. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, do you play? No, I uh, dabble. I haven't played in years. Uh, well, that doesn't matter. If you'd care to sit down. Don't play. Don't play, for Pete's sake. Don't play. Don't ever, ever sit down and play chess with him. Now, Ben... <sighs> You shouldn't let losing upset you so much. Uh, this is Ben Bradley, uh, Mr... Uh, Williams, Charlie Williams. Uh, uh, pleasure, Mr. Williams. And certainly an explanation is in order here. Uh, you see, Ben here suffers from that most American disease, competition. He's highly competitive. And although we've played several games and he's lost only one more than he won... It's upsetting him terribly. Well, and that's okay. I understand. Uh, I'd like to straighten this out. Please. Uh, isn't this true? What I just said, Ben? Uh, no, I'll, I'll admit I'm a bad loser. I, I do have a tendency to overreact. <laughs> Thank you. Williams, uh, forget what I said. Oh, okay, Chessman, I'll, I'll be on my way since I see you had a game. Bye. Uh, bye. Uh, now, Mr. Williams, since we've cleared up that little misunderstanding... Would you care to play? Uh, well, I, um... Um, you're not still thinking about Ben's blowing up, are you? No, 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 not exactly. I, I, I'm not an expert, though. I, I never was, and I, I, I'm certainly rusty. <laughs> well, I'm hardly an international grandmaster myself. Besides, uh, I, I've just lost my job. I, I don't think I could concentrate. Oh, well, there's no better way for you to forget your problems. It, this will help clear your mind. Come, sit down. Good. Uh, now that you're comfortable, I'll make it even better for you by turning the board around and let you play the white pieces. Oh, oh, thanks. Yeah, good. Now, uh, what shall we play for? Hey, come on. You're a chess hustler. <laughs> good try, but no dice. Oh, no, no, no. Please, please, please sit. Uh, I, 
I'm not usually guilty of such stupid. <laughs> Neither am I. Find yourself another sucker. Uh, I don't want to play for money. Uh, never play for money. However, I must confess that although the game itself is stimulating, I like to add zest by uh, putting up some worthless bauble or trinket uh, like this. And uh, you can do the same. And there's something of no intrinsic value. This is crazy. Oh, come now. If it weren't for that ridiculous outburst from Ben Bradley, you wouldn't think twice about putting up something you have on your person that's uh, of no value to you. Isn't that true? Look, uh, who are you? <clears throat> the name is Chessman. First name, Lawrence. Uh, but but uh, don't be put off by the last name. It's, it's just a coincidence. I do like chess, but there's no other meaning to be read into it. Uh, now, uh, what will your stake be? Uh, Remember, something on you that's worthless. Maybe a fingernail or a, or a lock of hair. Is that what you had in mind? <laughs> oh, I do like your vivid imagination, Mr. Williams. I do sincerely. Surely you don't think I'm a practitioner of voodoo. No, I don't know what to make of you. Why is it necessary to make anything out of me? I'm an eccentric you play the game of chess with, and we'll both enjoy it. Now, your stake. Well, I can't think of anything... Hold on. I have a key to the executive washroom that I won't be using anymore. Will, um, will that do? Of course. Now, uh, your move, I believe. Okay. Uh, pawn to king four. Since you're rusty, <clears throat> let's just keep it simple. I will also move pawn to king four, which leaves the initiative entirely up to you. Uh, Pawn to King's Bishop for. I should have realized that anyone who had the imagination to consider voodoo would employ the Muzio Gambit. You know, of course, that it's been regarded for years as unsound. If properly defended. Well, I shall certainly try, Mr. Williams. I shall certainly try. Well... And, I think, also, mate. Hmm. I regret to admit that you're right. Uh, I'm not one to offer excuses, but, but I'd forgotten exactly how lethal the Muzio Gambit attack can be if you allow your opponent to gain timing. Well, thanks. I, um, I enjoyed the game. As did I. Uh, oh, uh, take your winnings. Oh, no, forget it. I, I just play for... Uh, I insist. Absolutely. I would feel ashamed if you didn't take this token of your victory. A debt of honor, sir. Okay, if you feel that strongly. Uh, I think it's only fair that if we ever play again, however, I should have a chance to win it back. Unless, of course, certain conditions should arise. Oh? What conditions? Uh, why, the conditions under which you would give it up. <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm deadly serious. This is a city of strange happenings and unusual meetings. It may someday happen that you will come across someone who will say to you, the Muzio Gambit is a very unsound opening. What? If that should happen, you will hand over the trinket you won today. Immediately. Oh, come on, what do you take me for? I have your word. Okay, you've got my word. <laughs> been let go? I don't believe it. Why not, Susan? It happens all the time in this business. Just because they lost the claim in account isn't any reason to let you go. It isn't as if it were your fault. I was the junior account executive. No account, no job. But well, you've been with them for six years. Surely there are other accounts. Well, they're not about to fire someone else to give me a job. Now, I'll give Frank Fentress a call tomorrow. He'll find something for me. You haven't called him yet? No. What did you do this afternoon? You must have known... Sure, sure, I knew, Susan. I, I just walked and walked trying to figure something out, and, and then I played chess. You played chess? Yeah, and, and I won, too. Look. That's pretty. No, it's not worth anything. I know, but I could have it pierced. Run a silver chain through it, and it will make a lovely necklace. No, no, I can't. I promised the old man I played with to, uh, to keep it. I'll be keeping it if I wear it, won't I? Uh-uh, can't do it. 
I know it sounds silly, Susan, but the old geezer said if we ever played again, I, I should bring it with me, and maybe he could win it back. You're going to play again? Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, I may not have it on me. You just finished telling me that you had to keep it. Yeah, unless someone comes up to me and says the Muzio Gambit is a totally unsound opening, and then I'm to give the coin to him. <laughs> unsound opening? You're the only one who's unsound, Charlie Williams. You're out of your mind. The next morning, I went downtown to the Fentress Agency, tops in executive placement in the advertising business. Fentress is on the 25th floor of one of the great old Art Deco buildings on 57th Street, and as I got off the elevator, I, I saw this glamorous movie star type wandering around the floor looking lost. Pardon me, but I'm a stranger to the city and this building. Could you direct me to the office of the uh, Fentress Agency? Uh, yeah, sure. I, well, I can do better than that. Um, that's that's why I'm heading. Why, why don't you come along? Oh, you are very kind. Is this Fentress a good agency? Oh, sure, sure. It's the best. Uh, are you uh, looking for a job in advertising? Uh, not exactly. I have some business with a gentleman I expect to call. He's a... Uh, Name is Charles Williams? Ch Charles... Well, uh, that, that's, uh, that's me. Oh, but how fortunate. Here I was desolated to think that I would have to sit in some empty room waiting no, for... No, no, wait. Uh, hold it a second. Uh, madame, wh why are you looking for me? I think you have something for me. The museo gambit is totally unsound opening. Well, have you? Um, sh sure, I... I, I, I wasn't expecting it to... Uh... You have something for me. Yeah, uh, right, right. Um, here, here it is. Thank you. And to show you that I sincerely appreciate this favor you have done for me, please accept this. She handed me an envelope and walked to the elevator and, and left. I stood for a moment turning the envelope over in my hands and then opened it. I couldn't believe my eyes. There were five crisp new $1,000 bills. I forgot all about seeing Frank Fentress and headed for the atrium of the building where I'd played chess with the old man. Uh, good day, Mr. Williams. Uh, yeah, change that to strange day, Mr. Chessman. <laughs> that uh, trinket, huh? Worthless, hmm? A mere nothing. Then tell me why she gave me $5,000 for it. Uh, softly, Mr. Williams, softly. Why don't you sit down? We'll have another game. No, no, I'm not playing any more games with you until I know what your game is. Uh, I cannot satisfy your curiosity or, or even carry on a rational conversation with you standing there and raising your voice at me. If you sit down, we can discuss whatever it is that has made you so upset. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> oh, well, as long as you're sitting, we might as well play. Forget it. Uh, I find that I talk better when I'm playing. I don't. Now, look, Chessman, I don't like being maneuvered. I'm not a pawn in a chess game. I never said you were. But you seem to blame me for what's upsetting you. Oh, and why shouldn't I? I mean, some strange woman comes up to me, you know, you might say ambushes me because I know darn well she was waiting for me, then, then gives me that line you told me about the Muzio Gambit, and when I give her the coin, she hands me an envelope with $5,000 in it. Amazing. Absolutely incredible. A fantastic tale, Mr. Williams. Uh, if true. If true? Uh, it's only fair that I play white today. Now, look, here. T take a look at these thousand-dollar bills. I don't know much about you, Mr. Williams, but I am not susceptible to bribes. Put that money away, and let's play chess. I don't believe this. <clears throat> I've moved. Uh, pawn to queen four. You mean you don't know anything about this money? Your move. I asked you a question. Move. Now, look, I don't know anything about the Queen's Pawn opening, but... <sighs> okay. Knight to King's Bishop three. Huh. Playable. The money. What about it? I know nothing about it. And move. Pawn to King three. And you never said anything to me about the Muzio Gambit being unsound, huh? Of course, but that was just a jest. Uh, maybe someone overheard me and carried it a bit further. Now, where did you get that coin? Was it stolen? Ridiculous. 
your move. But $5,000. I can't understand your anger about the money. I should think a sum like that would come in handy uh, with someone out of work. I don't like the way I got it. <laughs> you can afford to be choosy. Wonderful. Um, oh, by the way, have you ever handled an institutional account? No. Well, I guess I'll have to move my bishop. Hmm. It would seem advisable. I have a uh, good friend, Mr. Williams, highly placed in the Larson Tool and Dye Company. Hopkins is his name. He told me they're going in for a campaign of institutional advertising. I think you'd have a chance if you went to see him. Oh, and, of course, you can use my name. Look, I told you, I don't have a background in... Uh, that may not matter. It's worth your time, anyway. <laughs> Checkmate, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it is. Too bad. You didn't play as well today. No, besides being unfamiliar with that opening, I I was distracted. Mm, of course. Um, are you going to see Mr. Tompkins? Yeah, well, I'll think about it. Mm, might be very good for you. <clears throat> oh, uh, by the way, you lost. Yes, yes, I know. Then I'll take my winnings. Your key to the executive washroom. Is it possible that the key to an executive washroom can be the key to the solution of a most mysterious and perhaps sinister puzzle? On the surface, it seems most unlikely. But on the other hand, the chess master seems to know exactly what he's doing and why. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. To paraphrase William Shakespeare, all the world's a chessboard, and all the men and women pawns. You prefer the original? So do I. But reading the daily newspapers, it's difficult not to get the feeling that we're all pawns in a gigantic power struggle, manipulated by forces over which we have no control. Charlie Williams feels he is being manipulated, but why and for what purpose remains a mystery. It took me some time to get the washroom key off my key ring, but I finally accomplished it, and as I handed it to Mr. Chessman, he gave me a slip of paper in return. And that's my friend Tompkins' address. He'll be expecting you tomorrow at your convenience. I haven't decided about that yet. I'm still not satisfied with your explanation or non-explanation of what's been happening. Hello again, Mr. Chessman. Ah, Ben. Uh, uh, you remember Ben Bradley, Mr. Williams? The uh, gentleman who warned you against playing with me. Yes, I remember. I believe Ben has had a change of heart about playing and has come back for another game. Uh, am I right, Ben? I don't appreciate your sense of humor, Chessman. You know darn well I've come to play. Or do I have a choice? Huh. We always have choices. Uh, just as in chess. It's up to us to make the right moves. Now... Sit down, Ben, and see about your move. I've been married to you for five years, and I still don't understand you, Charlie Williams. Now, I love you, Susan. I love you, too, but you're not going to get away with changing the subject. Okay, okay. I want to see Frank Fentress before I see this Tompkins. Why? Because I know Frank. I know his agency. He's legitimate. How do you know Tompkins isn't? I don't, but... Look, $5,000, what do we do with the money? Put it in the bank. How do I show it on my income tax? Well, what did I do to earn it? Don't ask me. Ask that crazy old man you played chess with. He started the whole thing. I have. And what did he say? He claimed he didn't know anything about it. <laughs> do you believe that? I don't know what to believe. He even had the nerve to suggest I, I might have been lying about it. Well... If he really didn't know... Come that... on, Sue. He was the one who gave me that rigmarole about the Museo Gambit. And, and she repeated it word for word. Gosh, I just wish I knew somebody with the police or, or the FBI that I could tell about this. I don't like the sound of the police, Charlie. After all, there's nothing very criminal about what's happened. Isn't it possible that this old man really took a liking to you and tried to get you a job at this tool and dye plant? Yeah, it is possible, I just wish that there was some way I could test it. 
You can test it by going out and seeing this Tompkins and talking to him. Wait a minute. Wait, I just got an idea. I think I found a way to get some answers. The next day, I went right to the lobby of the building where Chessman hung out. His usual table was empty, so I sat down and waited. About 11 o'clock, he showed up carrying his chessboard and his box with the pieces. He spotted me right away, and as he sat down... Good morning, Mr. Williams. Bright and early today, aren't we? Uh, how did your talk with Mr. Tompkins go? I haven't seen him yet. That's why I was waiting here. Mm. Care for a game? Uh, no, no, not now, thanks. I, uh, I really don't have the time. You see, um, I had a lucky break yesterday. I got my old job back. Huh? Congratulations. Yeah, that's why it didn't make any sense to go and see your friend. I understand. But, uh... Why were you waiting for me? I, I know it sounds crazy, but uh, I came for my washroom key. I, mean, I don't think it would look too good if I, if I said I'd thrown it away. Since, since I know it's not worth anything to you, I'd, uh, I'd like to have it back. But you lost it on the field of battle, so to speak. Debt of honor. Oh, come on, Mr. Chessman. You say you have my best interest at heart. The key can't mean anything to you. I play fair, and I play by my rules, Mr. Williams. I won that key, and it's mine. If you'd like me to write a note to your employers, telling them the circumstances... You really are a first-class nut, aren't you? Hmm. I'm sorry if you feel that way. I'd certainly be more than happy to play another game and put the key up against something else that has no value for you. I'm going to make you a promise, Chessman. The next time we play, I'll win. Hmm. That's a challenge that I will happily... Except. When Chessman refused to return my key, I knew what I had to do. And I did it before setting off for the Larson Tool and Die Company to keep my appointment with Mr. Tompkins. They were located out in Queens, and when I got there, the buildings looked so legitimate that my heart sank. I walked in anyway, gave my name, and after a suitable wait, was escorted into Mr. Tompkins' office. Uh, sit down, Mr. Williams. Oh, uh, thank you. I, uh, I take it you were, uh, you were expecting me? I was, and I wasn't. Oh? Mr. Chessman called and told me you'd found another job. Yeah, well, that fell through. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hey, give me a little of your background. Uh, the last five years, I was a junior account executive with White, Graves, and Pfeiffer, uh, handling a chain store houseware account. Mm -hmm. But uh, none of my experience is in institutional advertising. I understand. Now, the uh, salary is seven fifty per week with several fringe benefits, hospitalization, medical plan, a good retirement plan. Uh, no, but uh, ab about the job itself, sir. I'm offering it to you, Williams. If you care to, we can go down and take a look at your office. But aren't, aren't we rushing things a bit? I mean, wouldn't you like to hear any of my ideas? Well, I don't think you can formulate any ideas until you've made yourself familiar with our entire operation. You haven't studied us, have you? Uh, no. no. But I'd like to hear from you what made you suddenly decide to enter institutional advertising. I'm rather... afraid I don't have the time to go into that now. Why don't we go along and look at your office? <laughs> I walked out of the Larson plant with pretty much the same feelings I had when I entered, which didn't please Susan at all when I got home. I'm trying to understand, darling. I'm really trying. But you seem to have changed so. You... I don't know how to say it, but you're different. Yeah, you wouldn't say that if I'd taken the job. What can be wrong with a job paying $750 a week as advertising manager for a perfectly reputable concern like Larson? <laughs> I wish you'd played chess. I mean, that old man and me, we're playing a game, and he's trying to manipulate me like, like one of his pieces. So because of this feeling, you're going to turn down a job you need and which you can do easily? Is that it? I haven't made up my mind. I left it open when I said I had to think it over. Tompkins knew I was telling the truth. I'm still thinking it over. We've been at this for hours, and I'll be happy to go along with whatever you decide. But I'd be much happier if you could give me one single hard fact. One good reason why you should turn it down. Come in. Come in, Williams. Yeah, I'm happy you decided to come aboard. There are still some details I'd like cleared up, Mr. Tompkins. 
I mean, I'm, I'm beginning to get an idea of what you expect that's from me. That's good, but... that's good. As of this moment, you're on the payroll. And it happens to work out very well. Well, how's that? Your office won't be ready today, so you can do me a favor. Oh, of course. I understand you're a chess enthusiast. I beg your pardon? I'm talking about chess. And our mutual acquaintance, Mr. Chessman. Since you won't be around today, I'd like you to play a game with him. Now, what's that got to do with my job? I said I was asking a favor. This is a running contest between Chessman and me. And since we both know our friend's quirk about stakes, I'm furnishing you with a stake for today's game. There it is on the desk. Now, forget it. <laughs> you must think I'm a fool. I mean, it's perfectly obvious that you and Chessman are running some kind of con game, and I don't want any part of it. I mean, you, you're not offering me a job. You want a, you want a messenger service. You want me to, to carry this disc to Chessman. Mr. Williams, I asked you to play a game of chess. If you win, you bring this disc back to me. If you lose, well, <laughs> that's the fortune of war. I'll bet you right now all the money I have in the world that I don't win. Mm, no bet. You sound like a loser. I think you're going to lose, Mr. Tompkins. Now, I, I don't know what you and, and Chessman are doing, but I'll bet the police will be interested in finding out. Finding out what, Williams? That these so-called worthless stakes that Chessman plays for signify something really important. What, I don't know. But as I said, the police will find out. Sit down, Williams. Huh? Sit down. Now, listen to me. Let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that your wild guess is correct and you carry out your threat to go to the police. Now, let's examine your position. The police have only your word for it that the talisman you won from Chessman was the same you later passed on to your accomplice. My accomplice? Exactly. You passed the coin or talisman or whatever to her. She gave you $5,000 for it. Were you so shocked and surprised that you reported that strange occurrence to the police? Not at all. You pocketed it. And you turned again to play with Chessman, didn't you? Oh, at that time, I, I, I didn't know. Didn't know what, Williams? What do you know? Or think you know? There are people who prefer to be ostriches. Don't tell me this. I don't want to hear it. And there are others who are insatiably curious and have to know everything. Those are two extremes. Since I'm not an extremist, I find both extremes unpleasant. But if I were in Charlie Williams' place, I'd want to know what was going on. You will find out shortly when I bring you Act Three. In the days when luxury liners swept across the Atlantic, traveling to and from Europe aboard those queens of the seas was the ultimate in luxury. Passengers were constantly warned not to play cards with strangers because they were card sharks who made their living on the big boats. However, I've never seen or heard of warnings about sitting down for a game of chess with a stranger. But after hearing what happened to Charlie Williams, I'm beginning to think perhaps there should be. I sat there in Tompkins' office at the Larson Company looking into Tompkins' calm, complacent face and hated him. I hated him because I felt the truth in what he'd said. I hated him because I really didn't have a logical answer to his question. Well, Williams, I repeat the question. What do you know or think you know? Tompkins, I know enough to realize that I'm being used as a pawn and not at any chess game. You made some threats. Something about going to the authorities. I'm beginning to think you're seriously deranged, Williams. And it would be best for me to nip your nonsense in the bud. Now, how do you suggest I go about that? I have no suggestions. I think the wisest course for me is to call the police and tell them I have a man here to whom I've offered a job and he's creating a disturbance. Okay, okay, put the phone down. I honestly believe you're unstable. All right, all right, you don't have to practice your act because you don't have to call the police. Does that mean you've decided to take the job with all the duties and responsibilities that it entails? Well, it seems I have no choice. Ah, I'm glad you've come to your senses. It really would have been most unpleasant for you 
if you hadn't. On my way to my chess game with the old man, I had an idea. I stopped and walked through the plant on the way out, looking and talking with some of the workers and foremen who all seemed genuine and unaware of the trickery that I believed was going on. When I returned to the lobby, I spied Mr. Chessman in his accustomed seat with the inevitable chess board set up before him. I walked over to the table. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. I am indeed happy to see you. Uh, please, have a seat. Oh, thanks. I think we might even allow you to have the white pieces today. You play a much stronger game with white, you know. What difference does it make? It's all fixed. Fixed? Uh, how can one fix a chess game? Well, easily. When a pro like you plays an amateur like me, you, you can win or lose just as you like. <laughs> you have a feverish imagination, as I've noted before, Mr. Williams. But shall we begin? Oh, uh, have you brought your steak? Sure, sure. Here it is. Hmm. And would you like to have your washroom key back? <laughs> you must know it doesn't matter now. Uh, fine. Then we can be sure that it's valueless. <clears throat> Mr. Williams, you're a trickster. And I don't believe you realize how dangerous it can be to attempt this shabby sort of subterfuge. I don't know what you're talking about. The disc, sir. The disc. This is not the disc that you were given at the plant. It must be. Mr. Williams, I'm going to give you just 60 seconds to produce the real disc. But it's valueless. What difference does it make? You're not dealing with ninnies, Mr. Williams. There are 50 seconds left. So you admit that there is some value to these little tokens you play for, huh? 40 seconds. I say that's the disc Tompkins gave me, and that is the disc. Now, you must believe me. 30 seconds. <sighs> you know, there's really nothing you can do to me. I mean, are you going to threaten to shoot me or poison me right here in the lobby? Uh, Mr. Williams, I suggest that you call your wife. What? I said, call your wife. And I suggest when you speak with her, please reassure her. I had an uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach as I went to a phone and dialed my number and waited for it to ring. Hello? Susan? Susan, this is Charlie. Is everything okay? What's going on? What are you doing, Charlie? Susan, there, there, there's nothing, nothing to worry about, I promise you. But there's a man and a woman here, and, and they frighten me, Charlie. I'm worried. No... I'm scared to death. Are you all right? Susan, I'm fine. Believe me, I'm fine. And I promise you nothing's going to happen to either of us. When will you be home? I I'll be home for dinner, darling. And Susan, darling, I know, I know you'll be happy to hear. I took the job with Larson. I don't know whether I was more angry or more scared. But as I went back and sat down opposite Chessman... I knew I was shaking, and I tried to control it. Well, I hope you had a nice chat with your lovely wife. Okay, here's what you want. Thank you. Uh, shall we uh, play now? Do we have to continue with this ridiculous charade? Whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. Uh, you're quite a philosopher as well as a chess player, but I'd like you to tell me how you knew I didn't give you the real disc. If I told you... Then you would know as much as I do. And the next time we play... There isn't going to be a next time. Oh? Why not? You made a mistake, Chessman. You made a bad move when you sent those people to threaten my wife. Now when I go to the police, Susan will be able to back up my story. You do underestimate me, Mr. Williams. No one threatened your wife in any way. All those people did was to express their concern about your behavior, which has been rather erratic, to say the least. I don't believe you. Uh, of course you do. Would you please make your first move? You really intend to go through with this chess game farce? Mm, your stupidity is monumental. For me, this is a ritual and a pastime. Now, 
Even if your absurd imaginings were true, wouldn't it be logical to try to checkmate me and thus stop me from winning this disc? Well, move. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there, you played well with the Muzio Gambit last time. I'm giving you the opportunity to try it again. Why not? No matter what you say, Susan doesn't think I'm crazy. Of course not. Uh, by the way, instead of playing purely defense against the Muzio Gambit, there is a counter gambit. There. And when I explain everything to her, she'll understand. Understand what? That you've been behaving strangely ever since you lost your job? Imagining all sorts of hobgoblins? Even going so far as to fantasize that a perfectly legitimate job offer had sinister undertones? And I can convince her that it does. There. There's my move. Yeah. And, and who do you think she's going to believe? Me or, or a couple of strangers? Hmm. You may be rash enough to play the Muzio Gambit, but I don't think you'll be rash enough to risk your marriage. And indeed, your entire life. Your move. You bet it is. And this time you're the one who's taking chances. I still say my word will weigh more heavily with Susan than anything you say. Perhaps. But how about facts? Hard facts. For instance, if your key to the executive washroom were to be discovered in, shall we say, a place that might make you a prime suspect in a most serious matter, what would your wife's reaction be to that? You'd actually frame me? I'm moving my rook's paw. I'm curious. What would the charges be? Embezzlement? Huh? Drug dealing? You would do better to pay attention to the game. Your position is deteriorating rapidly. Yes, I'll admit that's a smart move you just made, but you're really playing another game besides this, aren't you? You still have a move. I don't like my position. If I were playing white, I shouldn't care for it very much either. <laughs> do you resign? No. No, not yet. Oh, well, that's no good. You don't really have any options, Mr. Williams. Surely even a player of your limited ability can see the situation is hopeless. Resign. Now, look, I'll make a deal with you, Chessman. Tell me what the stakes are. Then I'll make my move. You're in no position to make any deals. You seem to have forgotten that two of my pieces are surrounding your queen. I, of course, refer to your wife. You wouldn't dare make a move there because that would bring you out into the open. Hmm. Your position is hopeless. Either resign or move. No, no, no. I don't agree that my position is hopeless because I believe in miracles. I don't. Move. Why don't you just grab the disc? I play by the rules. Move. Okay. All right. I think my move may come as a surprise to you. <laughs> a pleasant surprise. Because on this move, I call check and meet. You see it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a mate, all right. I'll take the disc, Victor Sergev. Federal Bureau of Investigation. Check mate, I believe, Mr. Chessman Sergev, or whatever your name is. Uh, I, 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 I don't know you, sir. Uh, your credentials seem to be in order, but your actions are outrageous. Uh, what possible interest can the FBI have in me? Espionage. The transmission of secret information from the United States to the Soviet Union. <gasps> Absurd. Totally ridiculous. Yeah, the FBI told me they'd been working on the case for a long time. They finally cracked it. The information is in the disc. You seem to know a lot more than I do. Uh, the uh, disc was in your possession. And uh, I suggest to this agent that he look very closely into your background. The information is cleverly concealed in the disc, and that tiny indent near the center identifies the disc. It's hardly noticeable to anyone who doesn't know it's there. <coughs> All these uh, ridiculous charges, uh, which won't stand up for a minute in the court of law. I think they will, Sergev. You see, Mr. Williams came to us last night and told us his problem. Before he went to see your pal Tompkins, we had him wired. As a matter of fact, Sergev, he's been wired all day. 
And your conversation makes very interesting listening. I'd rather say fascinating, whatever your game is. I think they'll let you take your chessboard to the slammer. I looked for a big story in the papers, but someone must have put a lid on it because I only found a small item on page 7, noting that a suspected Soviet spy ring had been broken. Susan was just as happy that my name wasn't mentioned and even happier when I got a great new job. Walking through that two-story lobby the other day, I saw two young fellows playing chess. I didn't stop. Everyone knows about the great victory Bobby Fischer of the United States won over Boris Spassky of the Soviet Union in Iceland in 1972. But only the Icelanders know the real reason why Fischer attained his miraculous ability to escape Spassky's attacks. The match was staged next to a farm called Elves Hill, and the natives knew that Spassky had offended the elves and was duly punished. I'll be back with the relationship of chess to women's rights after these messages. chess was played in Persia in the 6th century, women's rights were unheard of. Yet women's libbers might well note the way the game was designed. First, the placement of the pieces. The queen is a lady, so she always chooses her color. And which is the most powerful piece on the board? The queen. And which has the least power? The poor, masculine king. As a famous Belgian detective might say, it gives one furiously to think. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Fred Gwynn, Lamese Ferris, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, look, you don't make... A decision to kill your uncle every day. Carl, I am not minimizing this thing, but it has to be done. <sighs> yes. All right. Let's go. Get it over with. No, no, Carl, come back. Don't do it. Come back. Waldo, what is the matter with you? That man, Edna, tonight, he is going to commit a murder. Oh, who's he going to kill? You heard him, his uncle. So what? So what? Life is precious, Edna. Not among human beings. Murder is their biggest outdoor sport. It's also their second most popular indoor sport. Well, I've got to stop it. Uh, how are you going to stop it? Well, I... I just got to stop it. Now, stop. What are you doing? Stop rattling the bars and stop jumping up and down Somebody, like that. somebody, please listen to me. But why should they listen? They can't understand you. Everybody listen. It's going to be a murder. This is Tommy Grimes inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.